And it's just like, I'm just going to send you this, this list of, it was from Precision Nutrition, which uh-huh. was great, good, and poor foods, which I think it's a really just easy way for people to like, generic. Not, yeah, you don't have to look into it too much. But she's like, I'm stressed about you sending me this list. And I was like, do you think that's because you have an expectation that once you see what's great, good, and poor, that like, now you have to like, like the emotion, like it's it's almost an emotional psychological thing I can think is now that I know better, do I have to do better? What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of the LT360 podcast I'm here with a new guest, someone that I don't really know too well. And um, I'm excited to learn about him. His name is Connor Clark. He is a coach. He's a co-owner of a company up in Connecticut called Lift Performance. And he is an all-service personal trainer. He does online. So he owns Connor Clark Fitness, which he can do a bunch of things with you virtually. So we're going to dive into that. Uh, we ended up crossing roads just via Instagram and connecting through some, uh, some other friends of ours. And I'm excited to get to know him. I think he will bring some value just from lurking, learning and looking through a lot of his content. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say, what he has to offer, learn about his business, his entrepreneurship, all of that. So Connor, thank you for hopping on, bro. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, happy to be here, man. Uh, that was a great intro. And uh, we get into it. yeah, let's dive in. So, all right. We were talking briefly before how essentially you grew up in Florida. Now you're in Connecticut. I grew up in Rhode Island. Now I'm in Florida. There we go. So uh, (laughs) that's funny how that goes. Um, What part of Connecticut are you in? Just to let people know. (laughs) Yeah. So I I live in East Hartford. Um, The business that I run is uh, Lift Performance. It's in Sullington, Connecticut. So uh, about 30 minutes south of Hartford, uh, right in the middle of the state. Yeah. For reference, what else is in Hartford? Give give some people some reference. What 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 are the, like major sports teams or big colleges or like? There's a, a University of Hartford um, is is what's best known there as Trinity College as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a sports team. There used to be the Whalers in Connecticut. Yeah. There's a uh, no pro uh, like major league team in Connecticut anymore, which is a uh, sad a sad right. deal. But uh, there is the Dunkin' Donuts Park, which is a uh, double a affiliate the uh harford yard goats for the colorado oh. Rockies. interesting that's a far distance to be from the from the from the mlb team that's yeah. why i didn't yeah. even recognize that that's cool all right so harford connecticut um where did you grow up <clears throat> so i was uh born in boca raton and then uh me and my family we kind of jumped up and down because my parents are from connecticut got you so, okay they, uh, they moved down there. I was born down there. And then between a few moves back and forth, we settled in Florida for about like eight to 10 years. So from like kindergarten to 10th grade, I, I was raised in South Florida in uh, Wellington. Okay. In Wellington. All right. I was like, what school did you go to? All right. So um, <clears throat> I, question, I've actually been to like 10 schools. I went to like a different school every year, which <laughs> everything was being built so quickly. They were just yeah. like this zone there in that zone. And so I, I switch schools like every year. Interesting. I'll we'll dive back into that because um, I think that shapes obviously that shapes a person, right? So um, that's interesting. Socially, you have to go through a lot uh, as a young kid. Cool. So, or it might have not been cool. It might have been hard as fuck. I don't know. <laughs> um, I currently, as we are doing this, I'm in Deerfield. Um, I live in Boca with my girlfriend. Um, I work in Boca. 80% of my clients are in Boca. Um, So I spend basically all of my time in Boca Raton. Um, Yeah, dude, it's gorgeous. Um, It's interesting, though. It's a hard place. Like, uh, it's a lot of keep up with the Joneses. There's so much wealth. There's so much money. It definitely, it definitely dictates and can uh change the way someone kind of goes about things so yeah it's it's interesting i don't know that we'll be there forever i don't know that we'll be there forever but where where, where, where are you about to you are you looking outside of boca <clears throat> honestly like yeah i mean there there's there's pockets of south florida that are a little more down to earth a little bit cooler um <clears throat> 
but you know, like what are the risk to reward ratios? What are the benefits? Yeah. There's obviously a, from a political standpoint, we're starting to get into that phase. My girlfriend's pregnant. So we're about to have a kid. So you got to look into schooling and zoning and, you know, like those sorts of things play a factor. So there's a lot of unanswered questions, but, um, you know, there's a lot of beautiful places out there. We're going to travel these next couple of years and really try to find a place that we, we both agree on and love and can can build there. So, um, nice. <clears throat> yeah, man. So have you since going back to Connecticut? Uh, what's the what's the deal? You've you've been there throughout high school, college into now. Yeah. So <clears throat> moved back up to Connecticut in 2010. I uh, went to Eastern Connecticut State University. That's where I got my um, my bachelor's of science in exercise science. Nice. And I've just, I've been up here since. Um, I moved in with my girlfriend in East Hartford uh, a few years back, probably like four or five years back now. So we've been there. We're also kind of having lots of discussions about where we want to be and, you know, yeah. moving, moving on, doing things like that. So um when you have a business it definitely you know definitely changes it yeah a big part of the conversation. Like, oh geez like i got all my clients how's that gonna work like, what, yeah. what's the so obviously there's next moves obviously this is why you have connor clark fitness right you're trying to um shift probably a lot of your income and ability to do business online virtually yeah and so let's jump um let's jump back a little bit what was your your middle school high school years like uh you said you bounced around a lot what did that looking back at it now how does that dictate and change your ability to like work with a bunch of other people and be of service to individuals who are looking for help and guidance and you're a coach as someone who had to obviously change schools someone who had to obviously make friends quickly uh, learn to, you know, be social and be open in order to make friends and then be okay with moving on and not dwelling on the fact that you lost old ones. So how does, how does that play out? Um, now? It was, a, uh, you know, it, it definitely took a toll, you know, I mean, that's a big part of my childhood. Um, so it, you know, it, as I was going through like elementary school, middle school, high school, like I didn't necessarily register the impact that it was having on me for you know, sure yeah, yeah. my friends um so often but uh you know i, I actually it wasn't too much of an issue like settling into new schools um i always had my siblings with me that we were moving so whether it was okay. with my older brothers or my younger sister um i always had like a sibling to kind of we we're all leaning on each other for that so are you one of three uh i'm one of five i have two older brothers a younger sister and then a younger brother so Shit. okay yeah. you're in the middle i'm in the middle so I'm one of five i'm the youngest of five okay there you go yeah yeah there's uh mayhem this is you have but you know my, my i got my one sister she's lethal is a great word to describe <laughs> her. she had to have been and uh you know, we just, me and my brothers just had a blast growing up, you know. Mom's so what did you guys, did you guys play sports? Um, what did that look like? Were you big football, basketball, baseball? What did you do? Yeah, baseball. Um, <clears throat> baseball all year round. That's really all we did. Um, yeah. When we moved up to Connecticut, uh, which is probably the hardest transition out of all the schools, I was kind of sick of it at that point, like moving up and just being like, damn, because I was actually at a school that I was really enjoying when I was a sophomore. Okay. Um, but kind of like pulling the plug going up there, I was, you know, I was a little resentful of the whole process as was my, my younger sister who was in high school with me. <laughs> uh, so we went, back, but back to like baseball and sports, we, me and my four brothers, that's all we did, you know, yeah. wake, wake up, sleep, drink, you know, uh, play baseball, go to bed, all that. Um, looking back though. I definitely had other interests and I kind of wish I played basketball, uh, a right. bit. I did run track, which was, which was fun. Um, <clears throat> baseball was definitely number one. Cool. What, uh, what are you like? Six, two, six, one, six, six three. three. Yeah. Six, I would, three. I would have been a high school player, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know. 
Um, what positions did you play in baseball? What positions did you enjoy in baseball? Um, I played catcher. When you were young, you just kind of bounced around, right? Like everyone tries to play a little bit yeah. of everything. But yeah. What did like, you get locked into? Uh, catcher was what I was when I was younger. And then as okay. I got older, I really enjoyed center field. That's what I had to play in high school, just because like the freedom. Like, yeah, yeah. You get any more satisfaction than like tracking down a fly ball or making a diving catch or like, you know, sending a seed to second or third base and like a yeah. runner, getting them out. Like, like that, I got a lot of satisfaction out of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I sought that so much when I was in a, like little league. I used to try to play center field all the time. And you just want to always throw someone out at home, right? You're like, I'm just going to drill this. I'm just going to And you just throw it like way over the backstop. <laughs> you just like, <laughs> send it and you just like go half an inch too early and it just sing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right intentions, way too much power and no accuracy. Yeah. I've been there plenty of times. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. It's funny to look back on that. Um, cool. So that explains. All right. So then you get into high school, you're playing baseball. Um, me personally, dude, like I, I experienced a lot of like injury and pain. I played basketball, football and baseball um, in high school <clears throat> and transitioning playing so much different sport, you know, different factors to each one. Uh, and I was growing so much between like sophomore and junior year, freshman and sophomore year. So I started to get tons of injuries. My lower back was always painful, um, torn hamstring, broken foot, uh, broken nose my junior year. So I like, I always was in some, something was always going on. Yeah. And that's what, um, th- that's what like really, continued to propel me to try to learn more about like how to prevent stuff and just, you know, working out, getting stronger, you know, trying to prevent that shit. Yeah. Have a similar story or did yours come later? Like what, what was your deal? How'd you get into the whole exercise science, sports performance kind of thing? Yeah. I, I had a similar journey. It definitely came a little, a little later. Um, When I got into college, I stopped playing baseball Mm-hmm. And I got into weightlifting my senior year in high school. Um, and when I got to college, like, you know, that was just as much as my academics, you know, to the detriment of my academics, yeah. <laughs> I uh, was much more into the weight train, like weight training. And like, you know, that was like my, my rock for sure. And my, my passion, I didn't commit to an exercise science major until the second semester of my sophomore year. But, uh, you know, just be spending time in the gym. I was always passionate about that. Mm -hmm. However, I got into a ton of, you know, I experienced a ton of pain as well. Um, those first couple of years in, in uh, college strained both my hip flexors, rolled my ankle multiple times, my, you know, injured my left shoulder to the point where like, it literally felt like it was going to like, it was like unplugged. Like, I like, yeah. you know, <laughs> low back pain. Like I had a bunch of stuff. And, uh, at the time I was at that, like, you know, young blooded, this, you know, pain's a part of the process. You know, I'll work yeah. around it. I'll just, you know, I'm still good. So I pushed through a lot of that stuff and it really accumulated in, up until, um, like my senior year in college, which is when I actually stopped working out for months. It was like over the summer. Um, I was like, I had a painting job over the summer and I was just like lazy, you know, not, not doing much with my life at that point. And, uh, when I got back to school, um, in December, so right at the end of the fall semester, I was like, I'm sick of this shit. You know, like I just knew something I had to change. So, It was actually, I remember the dates. It was December 16th of 2015. Took a picture of myself in the mirror. I looked like a bag of skin and bones. I was just like, (laughs) sad. Uh, I'll I'll have to send you the picture because you'll see and be like, okay, this this guy's what, 150? Maybe we can can throw it in. We can like blurb it into the podcast. It's, uh, it was a sad sight, but I was like, I got to do something here. So around that same time, I, I was fortunate enough to, you know, have a routine set up where I committed myself to going to the gym, eating right. You know, before I was at this time, I was sleeping in the common room of one of my friend's dorm dorm rooms on an air mattress. And 
didn't have a place to to really lay my head. Like we used to, I used to get the air mattress and lay it up against the wall so that they could put the the common room back in place throughout the day. And then yeah, I'll come yeah. back, move the furniture, lay the bed down, grab my shit, yeah, yeah. go to sleep. And yeah, it was, you know, I was lots of, you know, alcohol, lots of, you know, late nights, not a lot of self care, you know, yeah. beer, beer, microwave rice, and frozen chicken nuggets was what I was eating <laughs> until this picture. And, and at that point, I changed things around. I was also fortunate enough to, get an internship because I needed one right, to graduate, but I got one at, at this private gym. It was called Melt, Melt Fitness. Um, and so that, that definitely helped me out as well, like getting into a new environment and For doing sure. something that was in a professional realm. Mm-hmm. And there was great people, a great environment there. Um, but I was in severe pain at that point. And uh, I was still working through it, but uh, you know, the story can go on I, as far as like, how I kind of overcame that and it came me how I became so fascinated with pain specifically. Yeah. Um, well, listen, this is your platform. Take off whatever you, how, uh, yeah. why, 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 why did it fascinate you? How did, how did you get over that hump? Um, you know, I, I ended up having like the best, like a, like an incredible transformation after that year. Like I ended up gaining like close to 15 pounds, looked pretty shredded. It was the most like shredded I've been in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, was really proud of it. At that point, I was, uh, really just kind of opening up, learning more about myself, really committing to the fitness and like the, the art and the craft of it. And so after, you know, a couple of years went by, I was, ended up getting hired at this, at this gym. Um, I became the head trainer pretty quickly and became the fitness director. Not long after that, um, so I was, I was, had a pretty big role at this gym, but I remember uh, specifically late at nights when we're, when we're kind of cleaning up the gym, moving weights around number one, like I had back pain, like I couldn't go down and pick up a kettlebell without feeling it in my back. I also couldn't drink out of the water fountain without feeling it in my back. Like, and I was just like, I remember that because I was like, like I was bent, like I'm six, three, I didn't have to bend down too low. This wasn't like a little bubble. Like, <laughs> I only had to go down like this much. Hold on, side note, I love that you said bubbler because that, I get I shit for that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I get yeah. shit for that all the time. <laughs> what are you talking about? Like a bubbler. What do you mean? Yeah. It's a bubbler. Like a water fountain? No, nah, it's a bubbler. <laughs> I'm fascinated that like this imaginary line around Rhode Island, all yeah. of a sudden you speak a different language. <laughs> <laughs> it's vastly different. Where I was explaining coffee milk to someone yesterday and like party pizza and like doughboys and uh like just random shit that people have no idea and it's all just stuck in this little ass state that's the size of palm beach county <laughs> yeah seriously fascinating man uh, fascinating, wow. man. and uh so i i ended up you know kind of the next move for me was i was not feeling great i was in severe pain mm. and it was just the way i describe it to my clients now because i every time i meet someone that has pain i've been there and so I know first and foremost, not just the physical pain, but like the mental anguish and like the emotional burden of what I described. I remember I got back from a backpacking trip in Thailand and I was like more motivated than ever to get back in the gym. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is the shit I'm ready to go so much that I, I, <laughs> I did some crazy shit, man. But uh, <laughs> I showed up at like three thirty in the morning before the clients got there to like work out that morning. So it was like just me. Yeah. And then I think I got off the flight at like midnight. So like it was like this extreme, just like I'm jumping right back in. Like I was very motivated. I remember I was doing incline chest press, and I just kind of the way I described to my clients is like there's this little guy, there's this little voice in your shoulder. And it's like, then use your head. Your head's like, I'm, I'm digging in. Like, I got this. I'm here. I'm ready to put in the work. And there's this little thing on your shoulder saying, you know, not saying like screaming at you, like, no, your left shoulder is about to fall off. Like, you can't do this. And there's just something saying like, you can't do this. Like, it's giving you a warning, a big red siren. And it's just like, it's right there. And it's like, how can I go on with my body feeling like this and this mental like pushback from my body saying, can't do it. <clears throat> 
So I there's see. mental fortitude and then there's like risk to reward ratio. And I, I try to explain it to clients like that. There's a risk to reward ratio. And like, if you're telling me you can't do it, I'm going to ask you one simple question because your body's not going to be able to do it properly or because you feel like, you know, you're just a little fatigued and like, you don't feel, you know, necessarily yeah. uh, like you have as much energy as you did at the beginning of the set. Like there's a difference there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to, to teach people that because I think, especially like young guys, the, mm -hmm. the message is, you know, no pain, no gain. Like that's still, you know, you, I'm not sure how old you are. All right. I, I, I'm about 20, 26. You're 26. I'm turning 28 on Saturday. So like Happy me, birthday. thank you, my friend. Uh, I'm, I'm coming to this spot where like I'm transitioning further and further out of this. Like you don't realize that you're in this bubble, oh, like this phase of like, I'm sucked into this thing and you don't necessarily have an idea that you're sucked into it, but like you're sold it, you know, by multiple things and multiple people and ideas. And, you know, I definitely was like in there, which is like the no pain, no gain, you know, just it's all about like, just building muscle, going through it, not thinking, not thinking rationally with regards to pain. Yeah. And you're thinking more aesthetically than functionally and longevity based. Yeah. Yeah. Or you just think it's a part of the process. You don't think there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. Or you're just completely blind to it for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So I, I got out of that. I, I got back from that backpack trip. That was like a breaking point for me where I was like, here I am. Mm -hmm. more motivated than ever. I showed up this early and then I'm in the middle of my workout and I'm just still getting this. I'm like, there's something wrong. And at that point, you know, I really took self, I took responsibility for myself being like, if I'm going to get out of this, I have to, I have to do it. And that really propelled me um, to just onto this self, self education journey where I just followed my curiosity as far as like who, who I thought had the right answers or, you know, trying all these different methods uh, that would help me. And ultimately there's, there's been a lot of influences on me. I think one of the big ones at the beginning was Andreas Saltis, the body mechanic. I don't know if you've heard of him. I've seen the body mechanic. Yeah. I didn't know his, I don't know him by name, but yeah, I didn't just, know who you're talking about. The guy's a wizard. Um, really like opened up the you know, horizons for you. Yeah, as far as what was possible regarding pain. And so uh, I ended up getting out of that rut and it's it's only gotten better with time. Like I've, I feel more connected to my body than ever. And awesome. you know, I still experience pain and, and setbacks, but I know how to deal with it and I know how to be smart. And I know that that's what my clients, when they have pain, <laughs> they trust me to understand their pain. And so I have Correct. to recognize mine. That's a good point. And you got to be vulnerable about what you've gone through and what you are going through. Right. Like uh, for the last year, I've been battling a, a right ankle injury um, from basketball in a men's league, stepped on a teammate's foot at the last two seconds of a game going for a ball that didn't matter because we were down like six. So there wasn't even a chance that we could have miraculously won this game. And I just took the wrong step, rolled it, rolled it. Uh, I knew. Um, pretty quickly I'm like okay um, definitely tore a ligament um, Shit. could could be some other damage so <clears throat> I've been battling that and it's like whoa you have to understand internally like what's the risk to reward ratio what can I do um, what's going to be low impact keep and maintain you know lower body endurance and stamina and strength from a cardiovascular standpoint um, what am I going to do to replace that? Um, and then how can I like microdose my physical therapy exercises throughout my day? Right. So, uh, it is, it's, it's not to say when we go through these journeys that like, we don't have pain because it, you, you, some people get confused. They're like hearing you out just at the beginning. And I knew you would get there eventually, but if someone listens to the first five minutes of your rant and doesn't listen to the last, the last minute, 
right? They're going to be like, oh, this guy just miraculously doesn't have pain anymore because he got committed and watched YouTube videos. Like, oh, I get, why do I need him then? I can do it. Um, or like, why do I, you know, why do I think that that's not true? It's not that we don't have pain, right? It's that like we, and I always tell people this, I'm like, the reason I like this shit is because I just, I'm learning about myself at all times. Like if I work on another client and they're telling me some version of what's going on with their body, I'm self-actualizing that and be like, have I ever experienced that? Oh yeah. I remember that time. And like, oh, that's what was going on with me. Let's see if that's, let me ask them some questions and figure out if that's what's going on with them. And um, <clears throat> like, yeah. you can't, you can't stop learning about your body. And, and the more you learn about your body, the more you learn about your emotions the more you learn about the chemical and physical um, connection, the nutritional aspect of it, all of it ties in. It's like, I, you know, sometimes the day to day stuff gets like in a rut and you're just like, oh, like, Jesus, I just wish this wasn't such a grind sometimes. But then you look at it and you're like, what am I doing? I'm just learning about the body and I'm just helping other people learn about it. Like, that's so much better than sitting there talking about like communications for AT&T or something <laughs> like personally, that's, I just said, you're right. And I'm sure you get that sometimes too. You're okay. like, this is, this is kind of wild that, you know, it's wild in the first place that there's people that have to be out there teaching other people about their body. But because we are in a place in society where we're, we're, we're so advanced in some ways, we're so disconnected in others. It's interesting to hear you talk about it and just, understand that like you are still going through pain you still do get some min minor tweaks and injuries but because you know yourself so well and you took that journey you now have an understanding of like what i can do differently not just go zero to 100 or 100 to zero what can i do in the interim what can i do to make it better and how do i maintain it when i maybe go on a trip right and like some people just go on vacation down here in Boca Raton, everybody leaves for the summer. Right. And it's like, Oh yeah. Uh, my goal for a lot of them is like, let me just teach them some stuff that like they can go do wow. in a hotel room in, of Italy, you know? And like, if they're having pain, cause they're walk, walking five miles a day through Hills of Italy, like how can they help themselves so that they don't come back in worse place in, in a worse scenario than when they left? How can they just maintain at a minimum? I like that, man. I like that you're that you've addressed that level of uh, interaction with your clients. Like, I don't know what your demographic is like, but I'm I'm sure people going on Boca. There's a lot of people that are just visiting, right? Yeah, yeah, that too, for sure. So, like, you might be, you know, knowing who you're trying to help and what way you can actually help, because. I think coaches sometimes, I think more like, you know, beginner coaches, you know, younger coaches might think they have to, you know, always give it like their, their philosophy, their, their approach of what you think they need. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's like, it's so much different. You can look at it from their perspective and say, well, what are they going to, like, what does their future look like? Or like, what is it that they want to do? How can I help them? And just putting all the other putting yourself aside completely and just being like, I have these tools. Let me teach them. I always like to believe, like you were saying, I want to arm people. I don't yeah. want to just, I've always most enjoyed or I've gotten the most satisfaction from the, my clients that take something from the sessions that we have. And you can tell that it's building. Mm-hmm from day to day, week to week, year to year. And at some point, and this happened to me more often now, because I'm, I'm going later into my career, people are just like, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to change. I'm ready to go somewhere else. And they're always thankful. And I could not be happy. You know, I had yeah. one, one client that was one of my closest clients for four or five years. And we worked together over COVID. I helped her compete in powerlifting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was ready to move on. And I was like, Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, there's, there's someone else out there that's going to match what you're looking for. And if it's not me anymore, go find them. And so it's, that was very uh, important to me that I supported her for what she wanted most. And right. It wasn't about me as a coach. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and then, you know, even further into that point, like, 
how can how can we continuously try to evolve to change what our, our client what our clients want and desire and need is going to change it's going to evolve and you know not that we want to keep everything and hoard everything to ourselves but like as a sense of personal growth for me and a personal growth for the client if i can learn something new in the direction of where they want to move then i can retain that client and keep that relationship going and that might propel that person to learn the stuff quicker because they don't have to learn a new person. They don't have to go through the trials and tribulations of meeting a new personal trainer and a new coach and like trying to feel out the personality, trying to figure out what exercises work and don't work. Um, Because ultimately, like I see myself recently, like, all right, what positions and what exercises maximize this person's ability to hit this muscle group? Right? Like, you know, there's a billion tricep exercises out there, right? So how can we maximize their ability to get a good tricep workout in or a good pump, you know, into that area if that's a part of what our workout is today? Well, I'm not going to, I'm going to keep tabs on that. I'm not going to put them in the same like weird position that takes them a while to set up and just feels uncomfortable. And like, you can tell they're not exactly getting the rep right every time. And it's like, well, if I find one that does work better, like I've tried to coach them and cue them through that one and it's not clicking. That's fine. I'm going to do the one that does work. And then we might progress to that one. Right. Yeah. We might just change over for, for sense of stimulus, you know? Um, So I definitely, definitely empathize with where you're coming from. Like the, the other big portion of that is when some, a client looks at you and goes like, you know, I like this one, but like, I feel like I get a better workout with that one. And you're like, finally, they're starting to understand, like they're grasping it. And they're telling us like, internally, I feel this one is better and more beneficial. Good. Kudos. Let's do it. Yeah. You know? Um, And then that that's a sense of like, you're seeing that client self-awareness of their body grow. That's huge. That's, that's the biggest win for me. They come back from something and they're like, you know, I, I I did some of what you said and like, I did feel better. It felt better every time I didn't do it every time, you know, but like I thought about it and like, I I'm getting in further in that direction, you know, because if I didn't say anything or we didn't have that conversation or I didn't teach them that, they would have just went seven days or whatever without doing anything. It's like, no, they did it at least three times. That's a win. They won, you know? Yeah. So in terms of how you're taking that approach, your lift performance, your co-owner of that, what does that look like? Are you working mostly with athletes? Like what's your demographic? Yeah, we're with about probably 95% athletes there. Yes. Center on baseball and softball. Awesome. At the youth, high school, and collegiate level. Dope. And so we we run uh, small group classes for those athletes Monday through Friday at the moment. And uh, you know, teaching them body awareness positions, you know, being sp- so specific with the sport gives us a very clear direction as far yeah. as like, what we have to do. And uh, I will say, having spent so much time in both the sports performance realm and also like fitness, like the general population and like health, wellness mm-hmm. generally, um, there's there's like pros and cons and like it's a different industry for sure as far as yeah. it's one you can be more passionate about. But the sports performance one, it's so much different because you have to like, in order for people to feel successful, you could show them all the numbers in the gym and that they gained 20 pounds or that they, you know, they're hitting off the tee, you know, mm-hmm. eight miles an hour faster. But it's like, if it doesn't happen on the field of play, there's, there's a disconnect. And I know that that's where like accountability for ourselves comes in knowing mm-hmm. that this has to show up on the field. Yeah. Valid. So that's important. Like a stronger chest press, not necessarily going to show up. Right. And yeah, your your ability to round second base 
<laughs> you know, so like <laughs> I, I can relate. I get that. Whereas it's the same thing for general population, but uh, they value both more. They value the in-house gains and leveling up there just as much as they improve, you know, while picking their kid up out of the car, like, and they don't have pain. Like that's, that's a huge win too. That's a, that's the field for them. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, not, not to, yeah, not to take away from the fitness realm of what yeah, no. people love and what people find success with. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, 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 it's almost simpler in that sense because it's not so, I mean, again, I, I could be just generalizing here because ultimately everybody has a goal. And sure. if the goal is for an athlete that I want to throw faster uh, like off the mound, like I want, I want my miles per hour to go up or mm-hmm. I want to just be more confident on the mound, it's no better or worse than someone that's saying, hey, I just want to look in the mirror and like not, you know, hate my body or mm-hmm. not feel like I wake up and have no energy and I just mm-hmm. drag my feet all day. It's, it's a all win to win. Map. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It's all about perspective. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, that, that's a good point. There's, um, there's like a very finite focused goal on the sports field. Um, and that's one thing, honestly, that like, I, obvi- I so my background is athletic training. I got my degree in athletic training. So when you're talking about doing your internships at like a gym, Um, I was doing athletic training at colleges in Massachusetts, different parts of Boston. Um, And then my, one of my, my first semester of senior year, I did an internship at a sports performance gym that was run by a guy that was an athletic trainer for the Patriots, the LA Kings, some other like major sports teams. And he opened a sports performance place. So we had, mostly high school um, athletes coming in doing basically like semi-private group training for athletes like that. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> the the difficulty part for some of it with me was like, you had the personalities of, you know, like a real good basketball player that's coming in and he's like a junior, he's coming into a senior year and like, he's the big man. And it's like, you're trying to get this kid to just, eat a piece of humble pie and be like, bro, like, this is great. But like the next level is the next level. Like you have to put in the work and you have to take like these minute, you know, positions and like perfect them because back to what we were talking about before, like no pain, no gain is not the truth. And if you want to play in college, you have to be able to play. You can't be injured. (laughs) So like, um, you know, just doing more weight is not going to def- definitely make it better. You have to perfect it. You got to put in the time and like focus here. And it's hard to get a 16 to 18 year old kid to like really dial into that stuff. Right. And I bet you look back and like, damn, I wish I did this shit when I was playing. Yeah. Right. When I was in high school, like imagine how much further I would have been able to hit the ball. Imagine how much quicker I would have been tracking down a fly ball in center field. Um it's it's interesting when you look back at it. And that's why I always tell people I love the opportunity to work with athletes, but I don't work with a ton. And being in Boca, there's there's a lot more older population with money than there is, you know, young kids with uh you know a, a super desire to like play a sport. Yeah. So <clears throat> and just the nature of like the couple of places that I've worked <clears throat> were far less like uh family style neighborhoods and more more of like a you know older retired kind of wealthy neighborhoods so um it's interesting so how long has that been going on how long have you been doing that at lift yeah lift uh that was we started in july of 2020 so right in the middle of the pandemic yeah i was gonna say during the pandemic Crazy. Old strategy. Um, bold, yeah. <laughs> bold strategy, Cotton. Yeah. Uh, Yo, I'm so glad he's, like, <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to be able to see very well. <laughs> right on that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we, we started we started then. And, uh, you know, 
that was my first entrepreneurial, like that was my first time venturing off on my own. Cool. Um, and so it was kind of like you had blinders on because it was like, is this even real as far as like what you could expect from people business wise, mm-hmm. as far as who's coming in? Like, is this what the fall is really like? Because, you know, sports, sports world is so cyclical. Yeah. Uh, non season, you know, postseason, all that stuff. So, you know, for a while, I was just kind of tiptoeing every month being like, how is this going to be? Is this like how we're, how, like, is the summer always going to be this busy? Mm-hmm. And so now, you know, I'd say this past summer, 2021 summer, it's kind of like normalized as far as like what people have gone back to doing what they normally do. 2022, right? Yeah. Uh, so 2021, I'd say. So I meant. Okay. All right. Before, yeah. So it's been one before bit, this past. Okay. Yeah, when I'd say people are like, yeah, we're trying to get back to like how things normally were. In-person stuff. Yeah, not so COVID-related. Gotcha. Yeah. So we just moved out of uh, our, we had an 800-square-foot space inside a baseball instruction facility, and we were there for two years. We just have a temporary space right now. We moved just like three minutes up the road, and we're looking for just a bigger space to have more offerings and service our athletes more yeah more diverse you know than we could um and now how do you balance that with your online uh aspect and and is your demographic different for that yeah first uh the demographic is definitely different um i'm reaching out to people that most notably are now working at home Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I have, I have a girlfriend that works at home and I see a lot of the struggles she goes through, um, that she has gone through. And when people are start coming back in from COVID, I was still at the, the old gym that I was at before. And I just kept seeing like patterns, like people come back and they're telling me it's the same story. I wake up, you know, an hour, 30 minutes before I got to get on my call. So I just get some food and I grab a coffee and then I get on my call and then it's meetings all day. Mm-hmm. And I have my work that I, you know, I'm, I'm assigned my work and then there's meetings and I'm on meetings the majority of the day or I'm getting pulled in different directions. Mm-hmm. And so I neglect my work. And after the meetings, I have to now tackle a full day's worth of work, but I only have two, three hours to do it. So I work past my hours, 5 p.m. Now I'm working late into the night. Now I'm giving up other things like my workouts, my time with my family. Maybe it's my emotional, you know, stability, you could say. And just like sense of control, go to sleep. You know, it's different for everybody what that happens. But then it's like you wake back up and you feel this anxiety of I didn't get my work done from yesterday. You go, to, you go into work, there's more meetings. The work didn't get done. It gets piled up. You work later, longer hours. You start and that window of work has now, because you got to do work. It just, yeah. now you don't have a separation between your work and your life. And it's just kind of all blended together. And that's hard to um, kind of seem so cut and dry when it first started. Uh, nobody could have expected. I would go to the office for the past five, six, seven years. Now I'm working from home. This is awesome. I'll just work when I want. I can do a meeting from, you know, the kitchen table. I'll be eating. I don't have to get dressed, you know, whatever. All these different perks. But some of the cons were less obvious. Yeah, Yeah. less obvious. True. So I I find people are really struggling with that. I just had a conversation with one of my clients this morning. Shout out to Chris um, about this exact uh circumstance and the whole time all i get from people when i say that is they just do like no i know and they're like i know i have to talk to my boss about this i'm like i know you do don't you like this is bigger than what you think it is so yeah. my online coaching um i offer training programs because i want to obviously like train work out and focus on that aspect and then i offer what i call lifestyle coaching which I know is becoming more popular now because I'm sure people are finding that this is becoming a problem for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so it's really based around addressing their habits, 
like addre- uh, addressing their environments because mm-hmm. the, you know the, the contrast between you i don't know who you are unless i have your environment i don't know uh, i can't just look at you in like space like a black background and just be like I, I i know who you are you tell me yeah. so I'm, I'm not going to get all the answers from you but if you tell me what your environment's like and i can see your schedule now i'm like oh i'm starting to see why you're going to bed late and why you wake up 15 minutes before your call and just have some coffee and you don't have any time to do anything and why you snack throughout the day and all this like getting that that contrast tells you a lot about a person Valid. um obviously nutrition uh you know the, the mental side like we were talking about with like um whether it's with pain like understanding you don't have to sit at your desk all day and just like bear this pain mm-hmm. get up and move like hit, hit your steps prioritize your workout right like do some self-care stuff and so i you know i dive pretty deep with each individual and everyone's different um but i've had a lot of success with the people i'm working with i'm enjoying it and is it more of a consultation conversation is it like uh where where you're just communicating this with people after they give you kind of like the details yeah yeah so i i start off with a consultation so they they come on to a zoom call and i just get to know them um ask them about you know they fill out an application beforehand so i get a lot of their information you know their subject too yeah Yeah. so i use that to kind of just get to know them a little better and from there um i schedule them a again whether or not they're they're buying into the workouts themselves maybe they have their own workouts and that's fine if they want to do with me i'll schedule that in and i'll do a kind of like an onboarding um like data collection Mm -hmm. so i'll have them sync their smart watch or smart device of any sort that maybe can count steps hopefully that's best case scenario even if it's just the steps um resting heart rate their sleep um then eventually i'll work into um doing a nutrition data collection so i'll do have them do depends on the individual because some people have like a you know like they have like a bad history with tracking stuff because someone probably told them you got to track forever yeah, yeah. So whatever, whatever. And they just they think you do it once time. it's you're you're married to it you can't stop yeah. yeah and so i i treat it with an individual but i get the data of what they eat mm-hmm. um and so i use all of that to then come up with a plan based on i also do a schedule audit so kind of what i was talking about was like i basically have to do an exercise of I want you to chat out your entire day, Monday through Sunday. What happens at the most? Um, I like the transitional periods of your day. Mm-hmm. This is this is one of my favorite exercises to give people because it's it's been an eye opener for so many, and I I enjoy seeing their eyes go like this, right, and that like wide open like, okay, I can see now why my life is the way it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times it comes down to just look in your environment. So the, the drill I would have them do is wake up, like when do you wake up? 6 a.m. on Monday. What's next? And then they all brush my teeth, get dressed. I'm like, no, no, like what's the next like transitional period? It's like, yeah, uh, you know, 6.30, I'm downstairs and I'm making my coffee. It's like, okay, do you eat during then? Yeah, what do you have? Or I might not ask them what they have, but it's like, oh, you eat breakfast? Okay, 6.30, coffee and breakfast. When does your work, like what happens next? Kind of drop off the kids, blah, 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 blah. Goes through the whole day. And it really gives them a perspective of like, my life is the same every day, or maybe something pops up where it's like, I'm eating four or five, six times a day, or maybe twice a day. Mm -hmm. And it just opens up the conversation to have so many, it opens up so many routes, I, I could say, because you don't know how to, you don't know how to help somebody unless they you have an outlook and not just you have an outlook but they have an outlook because everything yeah. i do with my clients is together i don't just tell them and say hey this is what we're doing and they have no clue they're just yeah. gonna conversation to it's a it's an actualization that they have to experience yeah and it's a it almost ties back to what we talked about really uh earlier it really is like the concept of self-awareness right like if you're not self-aware of like where your time's going or 
uh, what you are doing nutritionally or how many fires you're putting out per day and not giving yourself any, you know, self-care time, then if you, if you're not even aware, we can't talk about it. Or like you said earlier, like that person can't sit in blank space and tell me they don't even know. They have no idea that they're, they wouldn't come to you and be like, so honestly, I'm really lacking the ability to find and schedule time to work out, eat three meals a day properly. And, and also just give myself 15 minutes to transition between place to place. Like, then why are you coming to me? Right. They don't sit there and tell you that. So that makes sense. Like you have to have that conversation with them. Um, look at their entire life model essentially and <clears throat> pick it apart, but not in a condescending way, I assume. Right. In a way of like, just talk them out, <laughs> ask them questions. They answer it with like, Oh, huh. okay. Yeah, I mean, you get you get a lot of those responses. You also get a lot of responses of like I just had a conversation with someone that was like stressed about learning about uh, what carbohydrates are good or not good for them. You know, <laughs> on a scale. And it's just like I'm just gonna send you this this list of it was from Precision Nutrition, which uh -huh. was great, good, and poor foods. Which I think it's a really just easy way for people to like generic. Not, yeah, you don't have to look into it too much. But she's like, I'm stressed about you sending me this list. Um, and I was like, do you think, I, I, I talked to him, like, do you think that's because you have an expectation that once you see what's great, good, and poor, that like, now you have to like, like the emotion, like it's it's almost an emotional, psychological thing I think is now that I know better, do I have to, do, do I have to do better? Like, you know what I mean? I can't make a mistake. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's even beyond that. Like people don't have that accountability for themselves. They're scared of that. Mm. So like, even just, that's like the value of knowledge, right? It's like, when yeah, you know yeah. better, you're, you know what the better decision is most times, but then you have to actually do it. You have to act on it. I think it's people are scared. Valid. All right. Yeah. So I get what you're saying. It, it's a, yeah. And a next step in knowledge also leads to a next step in action. And people are scared to take that actionable step or, you know, don't think that they're capable of it. Right. <clears throat> yeah. No, that's a valid point. Um, I guess you could say the same about relationships, right? Like, well, after we've been together for three years, um, the next step is moving in. Like, I know that that's the next step, but like, I don't know if I'm ready. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I, okay. So I can see what that means. Um, valuable stuff, man. It, it's probably been, um, your most, uh, self-fulfilling journey to help people with this stuff. I would assume. Yeah. yeah man. The small wins, the, the little things that you're doing. Yeah. Because people always come back and just, they say, thank you. You know, they, they always share their yeah. gratitude and I know how I feel when I'm grateful for somebody. And it's usually just a pretty pure feeling of like, I'm just grateful you exist. And like that, I'm, yeah. you know, so it's yeah, it's that someone feels that towards me for what I've provided them is pretty fulfilling. And I know you have, I don't know if you have it now or you're planning on doing it. You're putting together like a nutrition coaching plan, right? I am. Yeah. So, uh, limitless nutrition Academy. So, uh, years back when I was a junior in college, um, I was actually a sophomore in college. My second year in college, I had just transferred to a new school. Um, I was trying to play on that team, uh, play basketball. I did not make that team. We had nine recruits come up from Miami. Um, I did not have a chance trying yeah. to walk onto that team. And uh, it turned out I started my first entrepreneurial uh, venture. I learned so much about nutrition and the world of like nutraceuticals and supplements and um, the understanding of like low glycemic impact, low glycemic impact eating, um, energy consumption, and, and just everything that in the athletic training, in the sports performance, in the exercise science world, like no one was really talking about. Yeah. especially in like a college at a college level. So I was like, yo, like, this is, this is the next thing. Like, this is how I can advance myself and get better. And like, my training is going to evolve and I'll get more 
you know, rest and recovery in between sessions. And that should propel me. So, uh, I started learning about all that stuff. And for years I taught groups like every quarter, um, I would do, uh, like basically like a three week group challenge, um, similar to like the whole 30, you could say like you're basically for, you're cutting out alcohol, um, and you're committing to that, but you are basically committing to like low glycemic, low glycemic impact eating, minimally processed foods, um, and just learning like every week is new information that I'm sending out via email and video corresponding. And I helped a bunch of people, man. I just enjoyed it so much. And I love being able to help my family, like most of all. So that basically just propelled me and, and led me in the direction of getting my master's. So when I was getting my last year of bachelor's, um, that I told you I was working out of that sports performance place, my yeah. last year of my bachelor's degree. And that same semester, they, uh, they basically launched at our school that they were going to do a two year uh, master's program virtually online. Wow. So um, I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to do it. I don't know. Like, I love it, but like, I don't want to, like, I, last thing I want to do is be in school more. Like I'm just about to get out. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> honestly, if it was, if it was not virtually, I wouldn't have done it. Um, but because I had the ability to start it while I was a senior and I got to finish it while I already moved down here, um, I, I took that leap. And to be honest with you, bro, like I didn't really learn a whole lot in that master's in nutrition that I didn't already know from self-knowledge. Yeah. Um, and I, we dug deeper into a little bit of, uh, like the cellular science of things, but I was so ingrained in like watching and just learning from people. And I had already started on the, the journey of, you know, all these people that are leading the way from, you know, these 45 to 50, 60 year olds that we look up to in a sense, right. That are really knowledgeable. Like I had started to just learn and learn and crave all that stuff from them. So I learned so much that got kind of reinforced going through my master's and um, <clears throat> I've, I've done private nutrition coaching ever since I have not gotten back into like group and program based stuff. Um, I found such a value in being able to sit with somebody kind of like you do with your lifestyle coaching. Right. And just like break down that person's like habits. Cause from a, a, that standpoint, I mean, nutrition coaching and lifestyle coaching are very similar. Like you have to understand in that person's day-to-day -day schedule and how you can optimize what they eat and when they eat it and how that's going to improve their ability to be consistent and also get the results that they want. So um, <clears throat> I've been really trying to fine tune the ability to like duplicate that and get the most valuable information to people in a very easy to easy to digest way, I guess you could say, right? Like, yeah. Um, and the analogies that people find valuable and connect with the most, the understanding of like, you get your car maintenance and cleaned out with the oil and like you get your tires rotated and like, when's the last time you did that for you? Right. And people go, Oh <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't. Yeah. And so <laughs> So this, this nutrition academy is like something that I really want to focus on and, and bring back the group setting, the program aspect of duplicating um, and just good quality nutritional education because it's less about like telling people what to eat and when to eat it and more about like giving them the power and the tools and the tool belt to make the best decision in that situation or scenario that they find themselves in. So um, that's... I, dude, I have like a 200 page PDF, like book basically written out of like all the information that I know about nutrition. Like it's massive. And like, I'm like, do I want to like, do, do I want to sell a book or like, no, I want to make this easier, more up to date, right? Like how can we put it on a platform? People can watch a video that's eight minutes long on, you know, a car ride and like really grasp valuable information that you know once again will hopefully dictate and change their actions um because you, once you know you should do better but yeah dude that's so nowadays man like, yeah 
I really believe what we're doing, like for people, because mm-hmm. you, you kind of touched on a little bit was when was the last time you did that sort of maintenance for you? 15 minutes, right? Or something small. And I think it's like, you know, we, we live in America. We're, we're in America. It's the American dream. We got this just mechan this mechanism of who we are in our culture. And like there's pressures on all sorts of directions that kind of just like a water, like a water jet in a hot tub, like it pushes you. And it's like yeah, yeah. You're going. And there's a lot of resistance to resist that. And where where are those water like what are the what are those pushing you? Mm-hmm. Most often it's like make more money, work more, work harder. Um, you know, and if you're a parent, like save up for your kid to go to college, right? Um, you know, and it goes beyond into a lot of other things, but like, is there any pressure to take care of yourself? There's no pressure. <laughs> like it's yeah. it's almost seen as a luxury because what's the first thing people ditch when money becomes a problem? Yeah, personal training, massages, uh, you know, any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's just it, it's something that I hope that we continue to grow out of as a culture because you know everything you and I both know like that's why we're doing this is when you take care of yourself everything else improves and it's just the quality of life you know you can work just as hard you can have the same pursuits you can still save up this money for your for your kids. Uh, you know, college fund. Um, but it's, does your quality have to suffer because of it? Or can you find time to work out, take care of your body, have a stronger mindset, fuel yourself with good food? Like, it's not a trade. It's just a matter yeah. of like, pay attention to it. And there's just no attention at all outside of, you know, for the guys, go to the gym, just get ripped at all costs. <laughs> That's it. And then for the girls, it's like, you know, yeah. just do these same booty exercises over and over and then probably just starve yourself because that's probably the best way for you to lose weight. And it's like, all right. Like, yeah, you know, outside of, <laughs> it's kind of sad. So it is not a lot of out there, though. I don't want to say that it's just pure, you know, I'll no, 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 we don't want to generalize. Mm-hmm. Right. But like, yeah. There's there's a there's a persona uh, that is consistent um, with the masses and with the macho ness of the United States, right? Like I saw, dude, I saw this fucking, I saw this thing the other day that was talking about how we're we're playing NFL games in in England, right? And they're like the audacity of the United States to bring a sport that we stole a name from them and play our national anthem on a field <laughs> that in the national anthem talks about how we separated from them as a country. I'm like, but like the audacity, like we stole the name of the sport. We're now playing it on your turf and we're singing about how we separated from you as a nation. Like what? Wow. <laughs> and like that, that holds true, bro. Like that audacity is that macho-ness of the United States. And like, it's odd that we 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 do push and pressure people in so many directions that aren't self-care that aren't self-awareness um and it's sad because you know we've gone through a journey and we've been lucky enough to you know be curious and be at a time where we could be curious and could make money doing it you know and, and could support ourselves doing it um because uh you know a hundred years ago like you know you had the blacksmith and the farmer you didn't have the personal trainer <laughs> you didn't have the lifestyle <laughs> yeah like yeah. You know. <laughs> not, not totally useless but i i i think about that all the time like with my with my dad he's a mechanic like he can make yeah. he's a woodworker like if you if shit went awry like he can make anything you need yeah. this he's yeah. a, make sure you eat the right stuff no (laughs) whatever you can find you know make sure you do your squats it's like no you're gonna be on the move enough yada yada but it's uh, but it's funny because like the the balance of it is that we we've created so many jobs that aren't necessarily um so important to like the physical 
aspect of being human and like competing with other species on the planet, which is what most of natural life is. And we've gotten so separated from that, that our day to day skills and applications are actually killing our physical selves. You know, like the skill sets that we're acquiring on a computer are literally taking away from your ability to do a lunch or run or understand what your cravings mean and what food to seek out as a result of it and why you feel sick and why you're getting sick more often than the people around you. And it's like, man, if we could just like bring that self-awareness and combine it with the advancements in technology and Western medicine and the ability to share information through technology. And like, if we can just keep them in line, there's, there's such a high ceiling, but if we let one get too high, we lose, right? We lose balance and we can either be so understanding of who we are and be Buddha and just sit by a tree, right? Which doesn't help anyone around you or help yourself take action and grow a family and support people. Or you can just worry so much about building an empire and making money and making a piece of paper that you lose yourself on the part, the journey and the process. And I think about that shit all the time. Like, fuck, like, am I, am I doing every ounce of self-care that I could? No, but like, is there a trade-off? How do I balance it? And I, I've come across the idea of microdosing. Like everyone talks about microdosing, you know, drugs. It's like, dude, microdose your exercise. Like people in these blue zones around the world, they don't exercise like 24 seven or like go to a group fitness class in Sardinia, Italy. Like, (laughs) no, dude, Like (laughs) this guy is 102 years old. Not because he went to fitness classes, like because he just walked around everywhere. He ate good, clean food. He spent time with his family. He had faith in something. And like, he was a balanced guy, you know, and like we've, we've lost a little bit of that balance and just trying to help people restore it is fulfilling. Um, but it's, it's an uphill journey. It's, it's tough. I mean, we, I think we most importantly have to fill our own cups in order to, to do it. A hundred percent, man. Yeah. hundred <clears> percent. <throat> man, that was been getting into it deep. <laughs> I, I think the conversation's only gotten started, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the first ballot, time. Ballot. Yeah. You know, and I do want to talk a little bit about uh, Andrew Panther, which is how you interviewed him a while ago. I don't know. I don't know how yeah. I know Andrew Panther. Yep. But I ran track with him. Well, uh, we went to school. We went to school together. You did. Where did you guys? What, what so school? we went. Yeah, we went to LaSalle. Okay. So I met. I met. I met Panther when <clears throat> I was a sophomore or a junior, <clears throat> and um. I worked with the track team because I was an athletic training student. So like I worked on him, I worked on some of his teammates and then like we were hanging out with the same dudes. Um, He was chilling with my roommate. I was chilling with his roommate. Um, I mean, we've, we've been friends and close and worked out together a bunch of times. We used to work out together all the time up there. Um, Yeah, man, Panther. uh, We've known him for, I've known him for, it's got to be like seven, seven or eight years now. <clears throat> so, and we yeah. Found, yeah, he's, he's an animal. <laughs> and I, I love what he's doing. Uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't caught up with him in a while. I, I only, he was, uh, he really like, I never ran track before, but he was a guy that was always like cheering me on as I was going. And, uh, you know, going into a sport, even though I was like a, I, I ran relays and like short distances. I did a 300 meter, which I don't know if you've ever done that, but that is, you want to know what the burn is. Like that was, that was <laughs> it, man. That was hard as shit, but that was where I had the most fun, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah, I had a great time with him and just the group of guys that track and field. So I think he might've just shared a post of you guys on the podcast. And that's when I reached out. I was like, Hey dude, I know Panther. And you know, are you, looking for guests on your podcast and 
that was at least a year ago. I don't know how yeah, much. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I sent Bro. you this message being like, Hey man, what's up? What's up? And then maybe like a month, a month and a half ago, you're like, Hey dude, just seeing this now. <laughs> and I was like, dude, this is, this is yeah. hilarious. That, like, yeah. He's coming back to this. But I was also like, hell yeah, I still want to talk to this dude. So like, <laughs> I still want to, I still want some exposure. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, bro. I mean, and it's funny how ebbs and flows. Like I, um, I was doing, I was regularly doing two podcasts a, a week, um, for a while. And, um, just like wanting to try other stuff. And like, I, dude, I think about like, every time I meet someone, I'm like, fuck, like, I just want to talk to them for like two hours, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> but unfortunately, like there's an aspect of like, <clears throat> it has to be captured, you know, like there, there's like a pressure, talk about pressures, bro. Like you feel like there's a pressure that like, you have to create something. And like, um, there's ultimately the pressure of like, I know that when I have conversations like this with somebody, um, one, it helps both parties, but two, it helps every other person that we can get it out to. And just like we're talking right now, because of the fact that like me and Panther chopped it up for three hours and we shared it. Right. So um, <clears throat> it, it's crazy. And like I, I completely just like stopped checking my other Instagram account and like was not really even yeah, looking dude, you into like to, messages. You don't it's, have to do that, man. It's all good. Dude. It's funny, bro. Things happen. Man. Yeah, no. Back out though. You know? Yeah, no, and like that's what I mean. Like to have someone reach out and be like, "Yo, we have this connection. I would love to chop it up." That's a dream. I wish I had seen it sooner. <laughs> but it, it's um, well, it's, I, mean, uh, I value, I value. I've listened to your previous podcasts, and I've, I've I've gotten into some some of your stuff. Like, you know, I am for sure interested in like your philosophy and your approach. I, I follow your page. I see what you're doing down in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you were doing recently, but it was like, you know, like a huge group of people. Uh, you said something like um, nutraceuticals. I've actually never heard of that. I, I don't know if you want to share with me what that means, but I, I'm guessing so, that was somewhat of it. Uh, yeah. So nutraceuticals are basically like pharmaceutical grade yeah. supplements, vitamins and mineral mixtures. Um, so it's a, uh, you know, you can go buy like a Centrum daily vitamin and it's like, it's very low grade. The delivery system on how your body absorbs it is rather old and outdated and there's binders and fillers and um, all sorts of things that just like don't really bring you a ton of value and where they source their ingredients is pretty low quality. You know, like their marketing money is spent on marketing, right? Like their, their income is spent on marketing and like getting it out to people as opposed to like, let's find the science and the best raw ingredients and let's actually okay. get people the value. Yeah. yeah. Just like anything, right? Like, you know, LG doesn't necessarily sell the best washer and dryer, but they market the fuck out of it, you know? So like, that's what people buy, you know, like you can't just open up Amazon and be like, I want the best of everything. Number one, bestseller, number one, bestseller, number one, and get the best of everything. That's not going to work. So, um, yeah, nutraceuticals is is just pharmaceutical grade um, supplements. I'm trying to think like what what um what picture you might be referring to though. It was, it was a video. It was like maybe you know, your top last five or so. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, so that that's uh, one of the a gym that I work out of, um, Gravity and Oxygen. So um, I've been there for three or four years. Um, I teach group classes there, do personal training, nutrition coaching. We host, um, and this is a big reason I stopped doing my nutrition groups is because like the gym already had something and I just kind of stepped into that. Um, so I'm kind of like the head to the go-to head nutrition guy there. And um, that is a, basically like I was explaining before, it's called Noble. It's a 30 day commitment, no sugar, no alcohol, no processed foods. So, um, <clears throat> that was the first day introduction to the program. So there's 42 people or 48 people, um, uh, doing the program and, um, from all parts of like Palm beach County, but mostly Boca. And, uh, I basically did like a 10 or 15 minute presentation to people upon 
just talking about like my basic philosophies on food, you know, like um, you're not, you're not deficient in, you know, Advil, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like you're, you're not, um, you're not craving chocolate for the simple fact that like your body needs more chocolate. Like there's a vitamin or a nutrient in there that your body knows is in that food and you crave that as a result. And like, um, you know, don't think about taking stuff away. Like we shouldn't be like, Oh no, no sugar, no alcohol, no processed foods. What am I going to eat? Because honestly, if I asked you to, uh, I think this is what the video said precisely. Like if I asked you to write down every vegetable you can think of, it would take you a long ass time and it'd be longer than a CVS receipt. Yeah. Right. And it's like, so you, these are hundreds of foods per week that you're just not even thinking about or buying. And you're like, Oh no, I can't eat sugar. It's like, well, you can eat all of this. So like, why don't you focus on this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so like basic stuff, like I said, I like to, I like to give people analogies, you know? Um, it, the best. Yeah. I think it just, it, if you can hit someone in the heart on something else that they completely understand, or that's easy to process for them, then they can be like, oh, geez, I was just looking at it differently. You know, I was just trying to look at it from this angle. And if I just looked on it straight on, like it is what it is, you know? So yeah, that's, um, that's what that was. And I don't remember where the rest of that conversation was going or what you no, were I was just there. talking about, like exploring your page and like what you, yeah. what, you what you're up to. Um, yeah. As far as like the analogies go, man, that's, that's when I've had my like aha moments. I'm like trying to dissect this thing and I'm like all into it over here. And then someone just says something real stupid, you know? It's like one of those stupid analogies. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, damn. And it's just, I think it speaks to the power of like, you know, just like symbols and like images, you know, like what things are. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when you go down. And ultimately, I think it's, yeah, yeah, I think I think it's communication. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, because yeah. um, like you said symbols and like you can look at something and see what it like, what they're trying to portray. But honestly, if like you talk to the person who made it, you're going to get a better answer than just looking at it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, like the beauty is in the eye of the holder, but uh, and some things are made for that specifically. But to really understand, it's like to to really grow and, and understand and get more knowledge. It's like communication. That's why I love doing this, dude. Just like chop it up, actually sit down and talk for 90 minutes. Where does your brain go? Where does your mind go? How does one thought connect to the next? And like, how does how does that lead you down a path that hopefully on the other end, you're like, I feel pretty good. Yeah. You know, I learned something. I feel more connected to that person. I know that this is going to get put out after and someone's going to gain something from that, that minute there between like minute 42 and 43, where I said that thing, I, I think that's going to connect and that's going to touch people. So yeah, I should lose. I want to ask you like for your audience, cause I don't, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with your audience and like who you talk to or reach out to, like, is there one thing on your mind that, you know, to kind of take this moment to, is there a message that you want to kind of get across to your, who you're trying to educate as far as like maybe a question or um, a topic? In terms of for you, like what you could bring to the table? Yeah. Like for us to discuss it. Yeah. Um, let's talk. I mean, I love a lot of what we talked about. I mean, how we dove into self-awareness and just the transition times. Um, I think, I think obviously already brings so much tremendous value. Um, and I ultimately think, and that's why I started the conversation and the whole podcast with like, let's learn about you. Right. Cause um, we, we often see just an outside view of somebody and like, think like, Oh, I can't get there. Or like that person's got this and this going in their favor and I don't. So there's a disconnect. Um, but to hear something as simple as you saying i slept in the common room on an air mattress like i don't know it gets more impactful than that bro yeah. like you <laughs> where you are right now what you're talking about and the fact that you're running two businesses and helping people figure out their life and less than 10 years ago you were sleeping on a common room air mattress in a dorm room like I don't think people need much more than that than to know like that's possible, 
and like you can change your life around you can be in charge you can take control you can seek out the information that allows you to take action in the direction of changing what you want to change and obviously um it, it's it's you know we could talk like specific science of exercise and stuff like that but um more importantly like people just have to get over the hump of like it's possible right i saw something the other day that was um if you if you put your uh if you piled up a bunch of people you know if you put all your shit in one pile like stuff that you don't want to deal with and difficulties i'm pretty sure you would take yours right back out and be like i got this i'm gonna i'm gonna keep this because like you see what other people's problems are and you're like mine aren't so bad so um <clears throat> I've, every time I've ever done a podcast like this, someone has unveiled something as such. Like I lived in my car. Um, I was dead broke. I had, I had $400 negative in my bank account. And like, I had people calling and asking for it. And like, I'm only, I'm interviewing you now because you have a story to tell and you're, you've overcome something and like, you're still on that journey for sure. But to look back, um, and I don't do this enough to look back and be like, wait, you're right. Like I did sleep on a floor. Like <laughs> I didn't really have much going on. Now I'm like, you know, I got two businesses, I got my girlfriend, we're talking about moving. And like, I have the ability to do that. Whereas like you, you just had to sleep on a floor before. Yeah. It was wild, man. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think, you know, for someone listening to this, like having uh, the self-awareness, like you said, you know, like just being able to like, use i think people first and foremost as like a as a conduit to help you overcome whatever your obstacles are and you know i think putting uh, for me being a coach like essentially what i'm doing as being a coach is like putting myself out there as that person for someone because like you said you don't want to be i think i don't know what exactly you said but like i don't want to be answering calls for like t-mobile or some some shit it's yeah like, for at and t right yeah, yeah no, like, <laughs> no no hate on them but like we i think everybody including the person that does that job would be like this doesn't fulfill me like this is yeah. such a transactional thing yeah. versus being a coach is so much more um it's kind of like the the it, a means to an end mm -hmm. you know like the end oftentimes can just be the relationship and having that person there that can't be measured you know so you know being a coach like I think for me, I've had, it's the relationships that I have with people, whether it's a professional relationship or like I'm, I'm paying someone for a service for them to give me something that I think I need or just someone that you meet and they, you have these commonalities mm -hmm. um, it, to speak specific to the services and like what we do, um, you know, and it kind of goes back to people being i think slightly sometimes slightly like afraid of like the journey and like taking action because of the discomfort and all that um but that's where i think also like having a community of people together like you have 48 people at that spot they can look all around and they can see all those people that want the same thing and might not be in the place they want to be but like they're, they're like everybody's equal there it's like we're all showing up acknowledging that we need help with nutrition <laughs> and let's do this together. So find, find us community, find someone to keep you accountable. And, you know, sometimes that doesn't have to be a lifetime either. You uh, to kind of just get back to that point too, because I find that so often is people think that that when they start anything, it's for a lifetime, Yeah, you know, and I have to talk people out of that. You know, I'll, I'll be telling someone like for a training session, I'm like it's this amount for one-on-one. -on -one. And they're like, okay. And they'll just immediately like discount it. And I'd be like, no shot because they think they're already doing the math over a year. It's this much. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, immediately I can see it on their face. I'm just like, Hey, hey, hey. there's no, you don't have to commit to this long. Like I only want you here if you want to be here. And believe me, you might get more value out of like, just a month of our interactions. And if that's enough for you, then I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm people use that 
they don't use it consciously, but they, that's an excuse or an obstacle for people. It's like, well, I can't afford it or, you know, that's too much of a commitment or I don't have time. And maybe they're measuring it some way out of proportion versus being like right here, right now. Mm -hmm. Just being like, okay, I can start next week. Just once. We're just talking about doing this one time. It's like just one time. One time. Okay. One time. You, know, you don't have to do this forever. Yeah. Um, and that goes with like the nutrition thing too. Like it's 30 days. Knowing that it's not forever might take some of the pressure pressure off. Yeah. Like, okay, I'll give this a shot for 30 days. And if I like it and it works, I'll continue. I think that's where like the value of something short like that is. Yeah, no, agreed. And it, you don't want to like highlight crash dieting, right? But yeah, uh, but the ability for someone to commit to something nutritionally because it's such a big part of your day and chemically how you interact and how you are moving forward, your energy, your personality, your vibe, your grouchiness if you haven't eaten, right? Like the the outcome of who you are after those 30 days automatically changes the rest of your life, whether you want it to or not, or whether it's a large percentage of change or a small percentage of change, it changes you. And there's something to be said for that, right? Like this one conversation is going to change a lot, right? That one training session, that 45 minutes that you spend with someone one time and they're like, you know, I really can't afford it. Or like, you know, I, I didn't find uh, that, I, you know, I think I need this anymore. Yeah. Like, okay. But it changed. There was, there was a value of some sort there, right? You taught them something, um, even if it was that they don't like personal training or they don't like the, the gym that you're in, or they don't like the kind of person that you are or your political views, right? Like they learned something. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I, I think people, like you said, are committed to finding obstacles, making up this idea that everything is a lifelong commitment and that <clears throat> if it's not going to be a long commitment, then like there's no value in it. Right. Like it's like one or the other. I'm either fully in this or I'm not going to. I'm either looking for the woman of my dreams or I'm just not going to do anything and not talk to any women. Well, like, no, there's, there's an in-between, there's a value in doing stuff. Everything's in between of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's people think black and white and back to the U S right. Like we've created a very black and white culture and not a very gray culture. Yeah. Um, and that, that basic, you know, way of life and culture is, bleeds into our day-to-day -day life and our outlook as as just citizens of the environment that we're in 100 percent. so i think if anything man like you're saying like it's it's self-awareness um bringing it back to that knowing who you are knowing what you've been through who, where you want to go who you want to be learn on the process of that take the action in that direction and utilize people um you know, in community around you, support um, that helps a ton. And it's whether it's for a season or a lifetime, there's value in all of it. You can always learn something from somebody or teach somebody something, right? That AT and T guy like could teach me a whole lot of tricks that I don't know, but you know, and he might help a couple people throughout the day fix their problems. And someone's got to do it, I guess, because we've created that need. Yeah. But, you just want to think on the other end, like he's still learning about himself or herself and like they're physically, nutritionally, emotionally, chemically, like they're, they're aware of who they are and what they need to. Damn it. <laughs> Only one of the best for people. Mm. Well, uh, I gotta, I gotta scoop my man. Yeah, uh, man. I, I have to run too. Don't you worry. So we'll, yeah. uh, we'll wrap this up. This was an honor, dude. Thank you. Connor. Yeah. Um, where can people find you? <clears throat> um basically everywhere uh instagram tiktok linkedin uh facebook uh i'm most active on instagram and facebook so look for me there and then you can check out my website it's connorclarkfitness.com and if you're in the area or of connecticut or you know you just know someone that 
must train specifically with lift for some odd reason. If you really like me here, you know, <laughs> philosophy, if you want to work with, with us at Lyft, you can just look up Lyft Performance uh, and you'll find us there. Cool. And Connor Clark Fitness is just all one word and it's C uh, C O N N O R and then C L A R K. That's right. Cool. Connor Clark fitness. You heard it y'all. Um, I am excited that, uh, I even got a chance to, to chat with you, bro. Um, I think, like I said, you definitely brought a ton of value and, um, perspective to people and whoever might be listening, um, reach out to them. Um, if you have any other ideas on awesome people that, you know, in your network that you would want me to have on, um, always reach out, always let me know. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, you're going to catch some attention, man. Whatever I share here, you'll catch cool. some attention and I can't thank you enough, man. Like this was a great conversation. Thank you for having this platform and this space to have these mm-hmm. conversations. Um, and I got to acknowledge that we are in the man bone crew. Uh, yeah, yes. not on video <laughs> bone crew here and man uh, bone crew killing it I'm spreading a message here man uh, yeah. <laughs> not bone crew. um but yeah man i i'm really just thankful to be here and i uh, appreciate you deeply of course you as well bro we'll we'll chat soon we'll chat more and um i'll send you all this post-production stuff all right you got it cool much love as always listening uh Feel free to comment, subscribe, share, all of that. Um, Always appreciated. And I am, we are, life is limitless. Peace out.